Max Buffler and Glenn Elsroth on April 29, 1999. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about your life in the uh, 1940s? Uh, my name was uh, Glenn Ellsworth, uh, and in 1940, I was 15 years old. I uh, went to Marion High School. The high school at that time was up on Nelson Street where the high-rise uh, apartment buildings are now. and. Uh, at that time, uh, I was uh, working at Foster Ford Glass Company, uh, six to midnight, seven nights a week, and going to school at Marion High School in the daytime. Uh, Foster Ford Glass Company uh, came along and bought up the old Standard Glass. That's the name of the company when I first started there was Standard Glass Company. And uh, I worked six to midnight. Uh, seven nights a week. That was 42 hours a week. And our pay was $12.60 a week. I, uh, at that time, I would uh, get my check on Thursday evening. I'd go down to the First National Bank at 3rd and Washington Street. Uh, on Friday, we, they paid us on Thursday night. I'd cash my check, and when I went home, uh, Friday evening, I dropped $10 in my mother's apron pocket. So I went to school, bought all my books. Uh, I uh, bought my clothes, lunches, and all that on $2.60 a week. I, uh, the uh, three years that I went to high school back in those days, uh, you just went to high school in uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And uh, all the time I went to school, I ate the same thing every day for lunch. I went down to the old Pearson's Pie Shop. It was down on 3rd Street, just about where Kylie Law is set now. We'd go down there and we bought two second-day combo rolls that cost a nickel and a 12-ounce bottle of Pepsi with a nickel. So I spent 10 cents a day for my lunch back in those days. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, play any sports on the teams and that much because I had to work every evening six to midnight. I graduated from Marion High School in 1944. I uh, went to the Army. I volunteered for the service. Uh, three days after I graduated from high school, I went down and got on the train down to Big Four Station down on East Four Street and went to Indianapolis to Camp Fort uh, Benjamin Harrison. And uh, from there, I went to Camp Atterbury. Stayed there about two weeks. Went to Fort McClellan, Alabama, and took my basic training there. Then I went to Africa and landed at Oran, Africa, and uh, we went up to Sicily in Italy. I was in the infantry all that time. Went from the Naples all the way up to the Po Valley and uh, halfway back and. Uh, I spent an additional six months on uh, duty there as occupational troops. We had uh, a lot of German prisoners there that we worked in that. Uh, we went overseas on a boat and it took us 15 days. We left Pakistan and Virginia and uh, as I said, went on the boat and went over, and we came back on the boat, too. Back in those days, uh, they didn't fly very many uh, people over on planes. Most of the planes were bombers, and they, they couldn't haul too many people. So everybody that went overseas went over on a boat, and we came back on the boat. I came right back into Pasadena, Virginia, when I came back after the war. 
I uh, didn't have anything else to do right at the time, so I re-enlisted in the service, came home for 30 days, and uh, went back in. I stayed in the service another hit, and uh, when I was the day I came out of the service, I went into the reserve, and I stayed in the reserve. That gave me six and a half years in the regular army and 24 years reserve and a over 30 years in all. I uh, got a pension out of that. Back in those days, uh, everybody that got out of service uh, went out and immediately got them a job and went back to work. Uh, there was a lot of uh, work back in those days. A lot of small plants around Marion, Indiana that would hire uh, 20, 30, 40 people. Most of them are gone today, but there were little manufacturing plants, and the old Rootenborough Electric and some of those around here, Spencer Cardinal. They had three or four different foundries around here, and uh, there, was, there was plenty of work for us returning veterans. I uh, worked at Foster Forbes Glass and I went back and went to work there again. And, uh, worked there until I uh, went out to Leninger Company as a uh, an apprentice pipe fitter. My apprenticeship took four years, and then I worked for them uh, about 19 years before I went on the Marion Police Department. I'd uh, drank a dozen, uh, dozen bottles of pop 
the doctor much. You, uh, you had a toothache while you, you got your strain and went to the doorknob and pulled your tooth. And uh, if you uh, busted up your knee or something, you just let it scab over and uh, get well on its own. Uh, you couldn't run up and have the doctor sew it up or anything like that. I think that up until the time that I went into the service, I had been to the doctor uh, one time. I run a nail through my foot, and uh, I had to get a shot for lockjaw, and that's about the only time I can remember ever being to the doctor before I went to the service. I came from a big family. Uh, there was uh, nine of us set at the table. When we took a bath. We didn't have a bathtub. We had three old wash tubs hanging on the, out on the back of the house. And about twice a week, while well, we'd get those down and take them up to the bedroom, fill them with warm water, and take a bath that way. We uh, think we had our first bathtub in our house about 1947. I came home from the service then and, and helped put one in, and that's the first time that we had had an inside toilet or a bathtub in the L-drop instead. Myself, uh, personally, I like the 1940s. I think that the uh, families were much closer. Uh, you weren't running around all over uh, the world and traveling a lot. We had to mostly stay at home until uh, the time I went to the service in 1944. I don't believe that I had ever uh, been out of the state of Indiana in my whole lifetime. Uh, like I say, uh, very seldom uh, we had a car or anything like that. Most of the places we had to go, uh, we had to walk there and walk back. We had an old vehicle out on the farm, and that's about all we had to go by. Tell me about your job at Foster Forbes. When I first went to work over at Foster Forbes, I was only 13 years old. And uh, they were uh, wanting boys to set in over there. What we did, uh, this hot glass came down out of a tank and dropped into the forming machine. Uh, would be 
around 49 cents also. Uh, things didn't, didn't cost uh, uh, a dollar or two dollars to, to uh, do anything. Now, uh, I can remember back then uh, uh, my father going uh, week after week and uh, two days after payday, he wouldn't have any paper money at all, just be a, uh, a few little coins till next payday. And uh, I remember the day that I left for the service, he gave me all he had in his pocket, and that was a nickel and dime. That was 15 cents. I left Marion with 15 cents in my pocket. But uh, as long as we uh, worked, I had a couple sisters that worked in the box shop over at Foster Ford making the boxes. They put the bottles in and uh, we all uh, did like I did. Uh, we all put money in the pot at home and uh, we made it uh, fairly well uh, back during the Depression now. Uh, those guys uh, at the glass house, I wasn't working then. I was too young and uh, they only got maybe two or three days a week and uh, really made it tough. Uh, I remember going to the grocery stores. My dad had my little uh, red uh, wagon, and uh, we'd get the wagon completely full of groceries. Now, it was soup beans and hamburgers and stuff like that, but uh, we'd get that wagon completely full of groceries for about $2.50. Explain a little about the uh, entertainment you guys had. Well, like I said before, uh, outside of the uh, ball games and stuff we went to, uh, we had uh, four shows in town at that time. We had the uh, Paramount Indiana. They were their premium shows. They cost 25 cents to go see those. We had the Lyric Theater around on 4th Street. It was 15 cents to see a double feature there. And then across the street from that, that's where the uh, uh, parking lot is at now for the big Marion National Bank, was the Luna Light Theater. That's L-U-N-A-L-I-T-E, Luna Light Theater. It cost 10 cents to see a double feature there. And that was our uh, four theaters in there. And, and we'd have uh, band concerts out at the uh, VA hospital on Sunday afternoons. Uh, back in those days, we had uh, streetcars, you know, that ran all over the city. You could uh, you could ride all the way from Motor Park to the VA hospital for a nickel. You just had to get a uh, transfer and you'd stop uptown and get off of one car, and uh, four or five minutes later, your car would come along, and you'd take this paper transfer and get on, and you could ride all the way out to the VA hospital for the band concerts, and then you had to have a nickel to ride back and just reverse your route back out to North Mary. Uh, the car stopped at Highland Avenue and Washington, uh, during the winter months, but in the summer months, there was a track that take, uh, could take you all the way out to Monarch Park. We could uh, ride out there, too, and uh, those things uh, disappeared in about 1950. Uh, we had uh, no more streetcars here in the city, man, and we went to bus then, and the uh, price uh, gradually escalated up to what it is today and they've never back in those days in the, the uh, 30s and 40s those streetcars were self-sufficient but today uh, they've got to uh, put in federal money every year to keep the buses running in the city of Marion What was school life like? Well back in the 40s our uh, schools started uh, at the high school at 8.20 in the morning, but we had to leave home around 7 because we had to walk. I lived uh, way out north, and we 
had no, back then there was no buses, no bus transportation to get you to school. You got to school on your own. You rode the streetcar if you lived way out south or uh, somebody in the family had to bring you if you had an automobile. Or summertime we rode bicycles. But I, all the kids in our family had to walk and we walked to school. And in the winter time, that was kind of tough. Uh, it was uh, pretty cold sometimes in the, back in those days. Uh, it would snow here or in October, and we wouldn't see the ground till about April. It uh, just had snow on the ground all winter long. It uh, stayed down around 10 below zero to zero, up would get up to zero and stay down about 10 below. And uh, we had, uh, like I said before, we had to walk every place we went. We'd get to school, and we had the old steam radiators in the in the classrooms and the hissing and that and we'd uh, gather up around those and get ourselves warmed up before the class started we had those uh desks that were hooked on each other uh you sat on the front of one guy's desk and somebody sat on the front of yours we had the ink wells uh there and 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 uh, ink pens that we dipped in them. The ink well was built right in the desk, and you, the teacher would come along and fill that up with ink when it got down low. It was ink that they made right there at the school. The janitors uh, made this ink. I don't know what the ingredients were, but that's what we used to, to uh, write with. We had the books that we bought at the bookstore, you had to go down, to, they'd give you a list of what you needed, and you'd go down to the bookstore and uh, buy it. We used to go down to Watson's bookstore. That was at the corner of uh, 4th and Booth Street, where the parking lot for the Fidelity Federal is at today. And we'd get our books there. Your books for the whole year would end, end up costing you somewhere around uh, two to three dollars for everything that you needed for the year and uh, we had some uh, pretty tough teachers back then uh, you didn't uh, you didn't start any trouble in the hallways or any fights around those old gals that were teachers then if you won the fist fight if you was a junior or senior in high school and you won the fist fight they'd get right out in the hallway and fight with you Back then, we uh, we had uh, the number uh, grades. They, uh, anything uh, less than 60 was failing, and you go from 60 to 100. Between there and I was about a, an 85 student in most of my subjects. We had English and algebra and, and uh, world history and uh, that kind of stuff. I I would imagine uh, back then, when we graduated high school, we would have probably been about equal to about an eighth grader today. And the kids today are uh, much smarter than we were back then. Would you compare how life was then as to now? Well, life was much uh, slower back then. Uh, things weren't... Uh, go, 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 like they are today. You didn't have to be six different places at the same time. Uh, I liked it better back then than I do today. I, I have much more today, you know. I have a couple of vehicles and all that, but I liked it back then. As I said before in this interview, uh, our family was much closer. Uh, I have brothers and sisters now that I never see. Uh, one lives in Arkansas, and, and uh, they're just about completely out of the picture. We may get together every two or three years, and that's about it. But back then, everybody lived around the uh, word of German descent. It was kind of a ritual back then that uh, we went over to my grandfather's at least once a month. They'd have a great big Sunday dinner, and he had six boys and a girl, and they would bring all their family. They would have, uh, uh, they'd make uh, mashed potatoes and chicken and noodles in large cans. Those 
large cans that uh, hold about five gallons. And they'd have uh, great, great big dinners. All Everybody would come in, and then when they get done eating, they'd set out on the porch. The women would sit in the kitchen and talk, and the men would set out on the front porch there and smoke and chew and, and talk for three or four hours. Then you'd get ready, everybody'd get ready and get their families together so they could get back out to their uh, farm or in town, get back before dark. Nobody traveled too much to and fro after dark. Of course, back in those days, uh, if you weren't living right downtown, you didn't even have any street lights. If, when it got dark, it was dark. We didn't even have any uh, street lights in our barn lot. What was the town of Marion like, such as size and people and transportation? I would say that Marion was just uh, a little bit smaller back then than it is now. I think uh, back in those days we had between uh, uh, 29 and 31,000 people in Marion. Uh, the, we didn't have near as big a police department or a fire department back then. We didn't didn't need to be. We didn't have the trouble back in those days that they have today. Uh, people kind of went along and minded their own business and and didn't get in trouble. If you did, why your father and your mother took care of it pretty quickly. Uh, transportation. We had four railroads coming in here. We had the Pennsylvania. We had the Big Four. We had the Nickel Plate Railroad. I can't remember what our fourth railroad was, but it ran uh, right along beside the Pennsylvania Railroad that went uh, from uh, Cincinnati to Chicago and on into New York City. Uh, we had streetcars. Uh, running all over town. They went, uh, like I said before, from the north to the south end. And we had another branch that went out to the uh, west end of town, out in West Point. And uh, the forerunner to that, we had, uh, we had the inner urban that came through here. We had uh, the Western Flyer that came through here and went to Indianapolis. We had, uh, they went to Anderson. Uh, so that's how most of the people travel. They either travel by train or they travel by interurban or streetcar. I, I said before in this interview that uh, not too many people had the automobiles back then because they just didn't have the money to raise big families, didn't have the money to buy a, a, a car. Uh, back in those days, we had a lot of industrial plants, and we, uh, we've lost a lot of those since the 1940s. Uh, earlier in the interview, I told you that there were several in town here that hired 40 or, or 50 men each, and those things, uh, they, they've gone, and they're no longer here, and, and uh, we're having a, a tough time keeping up our industrial base that we had back in the 1940s. Do I have your permission to continue interviewing you on May 11th, 1999? Yes, you do. I'm going to start today with uh, my leaving uh, uh, the United States and uh, getting on the boat and going overseas uh, during World War II. I left uh, just before Christmas in 1944 to go overseas. Uh, we loaded on the boat at night after getting off of a train that uh, had all the blinds down. We came halfway across the United States uh, and uh, we didn't even know where we were at when we were going up through the mountains and that till, till we got to Virginia. And uh, we left from Camp Pakistan or Virginia, loaded on the boat at night. It took us 16 days on a very rough Atlantic Ocean to get to Oran, Africa. But 
the time that we had uh, arrived in Africa, the war was over there. And we went, uh, like I said, to Oran and were assigned to the 24th Replacement Depot set up on a hill in Oran. And we went there and stayed uh, there about 30 days training uh, for invasion. And then we went to, uh, from there to Sicily. Uh, we got on a boat and uh, didn't take us long to get to Sicily. And uh, we uh, stayed in Sicily about two months. And then by that time, they'd started the invasion of Italy. And we landed at Naples. I joined a regular infantry outfit, the 544th Infantry. Or we didn't belong to a division. They just assigned us wherever we, they needed us. We were out of the Second Corps, the 544th Infantry, and uh, we belonged to about uh, four or five different divisions. Divisions. I uh, had to change my patch regularly on our shoulder. We'd have to take off the old one and sew the new one on overnight when we were moving up with a different division. And uh, I went to uh, Santa Maria, Caserta, uh, up near uh, where uh, Mussolini's brother had a big farm there. There must have been 20 silos on this farm. It was enormous. And uh, we fought up through there, went all the way up through uh, Pisa, up to Rome, on up into the Po Valley. We fought through all those little villages up through there. Uh, Houdini, Modine, and we got up to the Po Valley. Uh, we, the war was over then in Italy. They were still fighting in Europe, but uh, we stayed there in uh, Houdini for about 30 days, and then we went back down to Monacatini, and uh, I was a guard at a German prisoner camp. Uh, we guarded prisoners there working uh, around the uh, uh, lakes and the, the streets and on the buildings, some of the buildings that had the back of them bombed off. And uh, we uh, worked those German prisoners during the day working on those. I stayed over there for six months then on uh, the uh, occupation duty, uh, working like that. And finally, uh, they said they wanted to cut down on the number of men they had. So I went back down to Lovarno, uh, the uh, Americans call it Leghorn, Italy, and shipped out of there. And it took us 15 days on the boat to get back to Capatchener, Virginia. I came right back into the same camp that I left from, Camp Patrick Virginia. And there they broke our outfit up, everybody uh, six foot and over. I went to the military police, and uh, everybody under six foot, they left them in the infantry or broke them up into other outfits. I came from uh, Camp Patrick, Virginia, to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. We were going to be uh, mustered out of the service there. But uh, I decided that I was going to re-enlist for another hitch. So I was given a 30-day furlough back home to Marion here. And then I reported back to Camp Atterbury. And I was assigned to the 214 Military Police. And they were stationed at uh, Camp Pope, Louisiana. And uh, I uh, went down there and reported in. I stayed with them about a year, and then they sent me to Chicago, Illinois. I was with an 18-man detachment there, and we were the military police in the Greyhound bus station, the train stations, and we had two or three beats up there on the streets where the taverns were at. And uh, I stayed there. There was uh, uh, 13 men and myself. I was a tech sergeant at the time and a first lieutenant. I was no 
military police, and I stayed there until I finished that tour and was discharged uh, from the Army. And one thing I did, though, the day that I was discharged, I joined the reserves and stayed in there. And that was uh, the time that I spent in the military police was very, very helpful in uh, me gaining a job on the Marion Police Department. What is a hitch in the military? Three years. Tell me about your life in an army camp. Life in an army camp uh, consists of uh, getting up about 4.30 in the morning, having about 15 to 20 minutes of calisthenics, going back into the barracks, getting yourself uh, cleaned up for the day, making your bed, sweeping and mopping around your bed, then going to chow about 6 to 6.15, which is eating, and then you come back and get your pack and your rifle and that and fall out about 7 o'clock in the morning and go out to training, go to the rifle range or the bayonet range or map reading or maybe just taking a 20 mile hike and then you come back in if you're going to take a long hike and be gone they'll feed you uh, your lunch in the field if not you come in around 11 30 eat at 12 fall back in at 12 30 and go out to train four more hours in the afternoon but if you're on a march or anything out in the field the cook section brings the meals out to the field and feeds you out of your mess kit in the field. You get back into camp between 4.30 and quarter to 5. And at 5.30, they'll have retreat. And you have to fall out and stand at attention while the bugle calls are played. You come back in, go to chow, then you can go to the theater. We had uh, theaters on the base and, and TXs. You could go over and buy soft drinks or beer and, and go to the theater. For, uh, I think back in those days, the theater cost us 15 cents on post. It was some of the first run movies at that time, too. Then you get out of the movies about uh, 9 o'clock. You come back over. At 10 o'clock, they played taps on the bugle. And that meant all lights out in camp. You had to go to bed at that time or go into the uh, restroom and uh, read a magazine or something setting in there, but you wasn't allowed to have any lights in the barracks 